as you're kind of pulling that up, I would love to explain two things just so the audience doesn't miss it. I would like you to explain what is the problem with having your blood sugar go up above the 200s? And I would love to hear you explain the, the lean mass hyperresponder phenotype. Okay. Um, before I get to, before I get to that, so I'll show you some of the slides here. And um, yeah. so can you see it? Yep. Okay. Yeah. So that was, yeah, it was 251 when I came home um, and checked my sugar. And I'd done actually a, a subsequent experiment where I had dropped the carbs each time, returned to that yep. in and out after my, my, um, after my shift. And I dropped the, I dropped the soda at one point, came back to 204. I dropped the bun and had a lettuce wrap, came back at 142 an hour later. And then I just had two burgers, lettuce wrapped with two patties and it came back at 113. So, like, so if you're if you're listening and not watching, I'm seeing slides, and you, we always we'll tag this in the show notes. Go to YouTube so you can see these slides. It's always really fascinating. But I'm seeing all these delicious looking hamburgers with decreasingly lower and lower and lower amounts of carbohydrate as you drop the shake, and then you drop the bun, and then uh, you drop the fries, uh, which In and Out fries are very good, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of uh, 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 I think they found a bunch of like, was it? cadmium or something some heavy metal in them or something recently really yeah well, good thing i haven't had them in years so <laughs> right um and so uh again last year i ended up doing a um some cgm experiments and this again this is a busy slide here but you can see um and for those who aren't uh, watching this um like you know i i checked out i had a pepsi and it brought me in the 200s I had some pancakes brought me up in the 170s just a single dinner roll brought me in the 200s. Rice was bringing me up to 190s. A bowl of clam chowder brought me up to 179, which is, you know, very bizarre to see like something like clam chowder do that. Even, but even like healthy things like sweet potatoes or watermelon were bringing me up into the 170s. Um, I did another experiment where I didn't have my CGM on, but I did, I'd have my glucometer with me and I ate a banana on just an empty stomach, just a single banana that was ripe. And it took me from 108 up to 179. Um, so yeah, huge, huge spikes in glucose. And then I at one point repeated that in and out experiment. And um, uh, where was this? Actually, I will slow it this way. Um, I had repeated the in and out experiment with the CGM. And it came back at one, uh, 299. Yeah, if you can look at that. Uh, my CGM went up to 299 and my glucometer went up to 265. Um, just ginormous spikes. So there are this, the, the name for this is postprandial glucose. And um, like you were saying, last year I went and had a CAC score done and it was, it came back at 44, which for my age range is like in the 99th percentile. I shouldn't be at age 39 having a, having any calcium actually. But I was like, when I found this out, I'm like, okay, what's going on? Well, like you said, I am a lean mass hyper responder, which means I have high HDL cholesterol, the quote unquote, good cholesterol, low triglycerides and um, a very high LDL. My LDL typically is in the like high 200s, low 300s. That's wow. normal for me. Um, so conventional medicine would say that obviously, you know, my LDL should be lower and that's the reason for my heart disease. And, you know, I think a lot of people in our low carb community, it's become a thing where, you know, you get a badge of honor if your LDL is super high. And, you know, it needs to be understood with some context with some nuance maybe there you know there's plenty of data out there that say that ldl is associated with heart disease there's you know I, I think it's it's impossible to ignore that data but what is the reason for that right our body manufactures this ldl so why would our body make something that's killing us and you know dave and you know can dave feldman if anybody's interested can go and you know he talks about the the lipid energy model and um, I won't go into that here, but basically the idea is that if you're eating a low carb diet, you end up having, you end up metabolizing fat stores for your energy stores instead of using carbohydrates. So 
you, you end up exporting what's called VLDL from your liver to, uh, to uh, supply energy for your body. And you end up having a lot more LDL particles left over after all that VLDL um, disperses this triglyceride to provide your cells with energy. Um, for me, or so when I started looking into this, I'm like, okay, well, why would my CAC score be high while some people who have a high LDL don't have an elevated CAC score? And a lot of those people are eating ketogenic diets. And again, I really was never like ketogenic until very recently, like really within this past year that I experiment with actually having my carbs at like 20 grams net or less. Prior to that, I was just kind of like low carb. And even then I was still pretty, you know, I was still pretty loose on it. I'm, I'm a fit guy. So why would I care that much, right? I'm not obese. I'm, I'm, I feel like I, I look muscular, I'm lean. I don't need to worry about it that much. It turns out I should have worried about it more because as I was getting to the postprandial hyperglycemia actually has all kinds of implications for damage to your LDL particles. And the thing that we do know about LDL is modified and oxidized LDL particles do associate or do cause vascular inflammation and vascular damage. And since I'm getting these glucose spikes and I've probably had these going on again, I've probably had these going on for ever for as long as I've known. And I think it's mostly genetic with me. But um, when you have glucose spikes that high, it causes all kinds of issues. And I'll share this slide I have with you. Um, I did a lot of um, I did a lot of labs and stuff since this has happened and to see what goes on with my insulin and um, um, glucose spike. So I actually have this slide right here I'll show. And for those who can't see it, I did a week of a ketogenic diet where I was eating about 20 grams of carbs a day. And my glucose at the end of that, my baseline was about 80 milligrams per deciliter. I did an oral glucose tolerance test with a 75 gram glucose drink at the, at the end of this. Glucose spike super high, it was up, you know, I think almost to about 230, 235. Plummeted right down afterwards, I was, um, well within the, um, I, I, I didn't like it, it, per the oral glucose tolerance test, I was not diabetic or even pre-diabetic I actually passed the oral glucose tolerance test where a lot of people like Ben Bickman will say, if you're eating a ketogenic or low carb diet, a lot of people won't pass the oral glucose tolerance test. That's right. I do because I'm very insulin sensitive. Um, I think what ends up happening is people who are ketogenic sometimes still aren't quite so insulin sensitive. So when they do an oral glucose tolerance test, they will see their glucose stay a little bit higher longer and they not end up not passing it. But to mind you, these tests are designed to be done with glucose, with carbohydrates in the diet. It actually is in the guidelines to have a patient eating carbohydrates for the days leading up to the test. So the second week I did a high carb week where I was eating probably about 300 grams of net carbs a day. I did the oral glucose tolerance test. My, high, my baseline glucose was higher, about 95. My oral glucose tolerance test had a much lower peak, actually, just a little bit above, uh, below 200. Um, so that that shows that, you know, it is, there is a little bit to do with preformed insulin storage in your pancreas so that when you do have carbs, it brings your glucose down quicker. So that's called um, first phase insulin response. I checked insulin at the same time as well. And here's, here's the thing. You can see with my glucose going really higher on, on this graph, it shows that uh, the, the comparison between the two weeks, when I had the oral glucose tolerance test, my, after the keto diet, my glucose was again, about peaked around 200 or so at the 30 minute mark. My insulin also had a higher peak during at the end of the keto week with the oral glucose tolerance test. Um, as compared to the high carb week. So when you're having high glucose spikes, you're going to have a high insulin spike. That's what's going to happen. When I did my labs at the end of both of these weeks, at the end of the high carb week, my fasting insulin was higher. So my insulin had to stay higher to keep my glucose lower because the body wants to be in homeostasis. The body never wants your glucose to be as high as 
people are constantly making it when you drink sodas, when you eat bread, when you eat pasta and cereal. I think these things are happening to people a lot and not everybody. I think there's a lot of um, genetic and adaptation um, uh, uh, factors at play into how high someone's glucose will go after after hypercarbohydrate meals. But still, when you have these big giant spikes, you're going to have vascular problems, really. You're gonna increase your insulin, you're gonna increase your um, 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 fasting, yeah, again, your postprandial insulin and your fasting insulin. And here's uh, really the, the, the big thing about it. You're gonna have all kinds of other issues from hyperglycemia. Hyperglycemia is like the biggest problem in our medical system with the diet, with diabetes, with prediabetes, it causes all kinds of vascular damage. And I have all these, um, I, can, I can give the uh, um, citations for these afterwards, but like I was reading several studies that show it caught like, just having even brief postprandial hyperglycemia, and I'm defining that really as anything over 140 milligrams per deciliter, it's going to cause damage to your glycocalyx. They can see in, in an acute setting, like your glucose goes high, they can see within an hour or two actual damage to your glycocalyx. They can measure it in your blood. Um, when you have even transiently high glucose, it causes a reduction up to 50% reduction in your endothelial progenitor cells. And those are the cells that float around in your, in your bloodstream that are actually responsible for healing damaged blood vessels. So if you damage your blood vessels, say you strip your glycocalyx, you cause all kinds of inflammatory damage through all kinds of means, right? It could be high glucose, it could be smog, it could be smoking, it could be exercise. But if you have high glucose, it actually reduces the amount of cells that are available to heal that area because those cells is the job of the endothelial progenitor cells is to float around latch on to the areas of damage and actually heal over it um if you've read malcolm kendrick's book um the clot thickens he talks about this process happening where there's damage to the blood vessel a clot forms because your blood vessels don't want to rupture Right? If your blood vessel ruptures, you die. If, you're, if, your arteri if your arteries rupture, you die. So a clot will form in that area and these endothelial progenitor cells will, go, will come along and heal over where that clot is. And that's why we find in blood vessels with atherosclerosis, you see kind of a layering and you see a clot even in the middle of the different layers. Um, one big thing that, we, that people talk about is fructose and being a problem for people, right? Fatty liver, we always think about um, visceral fat being a problem of too much fructose in the diet. And I, I think obviously a lot of us consider things like high fructose corn syrup a problem. However, there's something called the polyol pathway that really kicks into gear when your glucose is high and you will produce all, you will produce a ton of fructose endogenously. So if I eat a bunch of sugar, even if it was, even if it was straight glucose and no fructose in it, I will overproduce fructose because the body is trying to get rid of all that glucose. There's only certain, you know, there's only certain things you can do with glucose in your bloodstream, right? It, you're either going to burn it or you're going to store it as glycogen, or you're going to convert it into fat. One of the other things that you can do with it, though, is it'll get shuttled into this polyol pathway in the mitochondria and actually get turned into fructose because fructose doesn't raise blood glucose and it's actually less damaging for the body. But an overabundance of it is going to cause things like fatty liver, visceral fat buildup, fatty pancreas. That's right. Um, and, you know, obviously one of the bigger things that we see with people who are diabetic, uh, you get microvascular damage. Uh, particularly, like I said, in the toes that we see people get amputated all the time. Um, we see microvascular damage to the kidneys and the eyes. That polyol pathway um, often gets what's called sorbitol accumulation because the, um, the cells in the eyes and the cells in the kidneys actually can't get rid of sorbitol because the pathway works from um, basically glucose getting converted into sorbitol, getting converted into fructose. 
Well, certain cells don't have the ability to convert all that sorbitol into fructose. So the kidneys and the eyes get damaged quite a bit. And that's why we end up seeing people with um, diabetes end up with renal failure and with, um, and with blindness, with macular degeneration. Um, this is also where I think my issue with my CAC score comes from. All those times that I was spiking my glucose super high and completely unaware of it because I was fit and healthy and lean, I was oxidizing all of my lipoproteins. And as you know, I have a heck of a lot of lipoproteins. My particle number is high. My, um, you know, my LDLC is high. And even though they're the quote unquote large fluffy ones, I can still modify and oxidize those ones if my glucose is spiking into the 200s all the time. That's where I personally think the root of my uh, elevated CAC score is coming from. Mm. That was so well explained. I would just encourage anybody who's listening or watching, if that didn't make sense, you go back and listen to that again. Um, it was so important and very, very well explained. In the tradition, this is where the nuance comes in. Like you were saying before, like in the traditional paradigm, we think that the high cholesterol causes heart disease as the primary cause. And kind of what you're alluding to is, yes, it's part of the puzzle, but it's not the whole thing. You walking around with a high LDL cholesterol may not be as concerning minus some of those excursions that you were showing with your blood sugar. And, and again, for the listener, like I'm seeing these graphs and like if you were designing a wicked roller coaster that I would never want to ride because I'm really lame and I'm not, not much an adrenaline, adrenaline junkie, you're designing amazing roller coasters. It's a huge crest and a huge drop off afterwards. And you get back to a baseline eventually, but you're saying that those excursions over and over and over, the, the, the sugar accumulating in the blood for a time is what is causing damage, which is then part of the puzzle of getting you know, that fixed over, like you explained, or having your LDL particles be in circulation for too long, and that's where the damage comes in. Yeah. And you know, uh, I was looking at this, and I was trying to figure out, okay, is it the... Is it the peak that's the problem? Is it the area under the curve of elevated glucose? Um, and it turns out, yes, kind of the both of those. But not only that, but it actually the rate of glucose rise ha is damaging in and of itself. So the faster it goes up, the more damage, the more oxidative stress that you end up having that's just true. from the speed of it. Yeah, and this graph, just page right here, um, just so everyone knows, like, you know, a lot of people will say, well, your glucose is going that high because you're insulin resistant. And I just wanted to reiterate the fact that um, my insulin resistance scores are all pristine. Like in the, at the bottom of this page here, I'll, I'll list them off here. My HOMA IR is 0 0.8, kind of on average over the past three years. My LPIR score, um, it's a proprietary test done by LabCorp. That is zero. Um, my fasting insulin is about 3.9. I have a type one craft pattern. I've passed my oral glucose tolerance test both on and off keto. And I, and this is one of Ben Bickman's, um, um, tests that he likes the adipo IR score, which is 1.32. These are all very low show me to be very insulin sensitive. So that's not clearly not the issue that's going on with me. And like I was saying before, um, even though I had a lower glucose spike with um, um, when I was eating carbs, I was still getting pretty large spikes. And you can see right here, this is on my on the right side is my high carb week. This is the oral glucose tolerance test at the top here, starting that high carb week. And then just a, a couple hours later, I end up having some Indian food. And that I used to get on the ambulance all the time because I loved eating there. And you, you saw I had a pretty big spike in glucose there. And all over that whole week, I had large spikes above 150 up into the 180s very often. And um, so it clearly isn't, you know, an adaptation thing. I just have high glucose spikes. Now, there are certain genes um, that I've checked out that um, seem to make me more likely to have spikes like this. I guess one of the genes that I have um, 
that I'm homozygous for essentially keeps what are called the GLUT4 transporters closer to my cell center. It, they call it the hunter-gatherer gene, uh, phenotype, I guess, where um, or genotype. I basically keep glucose higher in my bloodstream for longer. It actually spares glucose. Um, I, I, I'm guessing just because, you know, you know, we didn't have so many high carbohydrate options available to us in the, in our primordial past, and you would go, you know, for a long time without ever having any, any carbs really. And I mean, I think anybody knows this, right? If you walk out into your local forest and you look around, how many carbs are there to eat? There's really not much. You'll be hungry. Yeah. Maybe some of the berries or something a couple times a year. And if they're not poisonous, you know, there's maybe some plants that you can eat some green ones that aren't, if they're not poisonous, but there's not big potatoes out there. There's not, you know, if you find a wild apple tree, they're sour and small. And again, only a short time of the year, you're not going out and harvesting the grains off of the, out of the grass there. You're just not. Um, so it, it just seems obvious to me that in our evolutionary past, we weren't eating anywhere amount, near the amount of highly digestible, highly absorbable carbohydrates that we are currently. Even when we were started to do, even when we did start to do farming and things like that, you know, though the, the content, the sugar content in the fruit was less than what we have now. The processing of the grains was much more rudimentary than what we have now. And the uh, absorbability and just the, the, the rapidity with which we take in these carbohydrates and spike our glucose is clearly causing a lot of problems. And I think even in our own like kind of low carb community, we find that I think it's a big blind spot. I think a lot of people don't realize that they're having these glucose spikes even when they are eating low carb, because I was eating low carb, but you know, occasionally I still have like a potato, right? Or a banana. I'm still within my low carb macros, but I'll still get a big giant spike. 